Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeff Tangney and David Shaywitz. Excellent. Are we between everybody and dinner or something like that, or drinks? Well, I think we are holding the group back from cocktails, which we are very cognizant of. All right. So here's the thing that intrigues me. Uh, Silicon Valley is um, not always known to be super friendly to, uh, to physicians. I've heard from Shamit that we're, uh, everything about physicians is suboptimal. Their uh, systems are suboptimal. The people are suboptimal, but he used a different word. Um, <laughs> I heard from... Um, uh, the node that we're sort of poorly performing algorithms. Um, on the other hand, you, for the second time in a row, have um, created this new business that's focused on the customer, as you know, the physician as customer. So is this sort of an act of charity, an act of pity? How did you uh, get involved? Uh, well, thank you, David. Uh, <laughs> Glad it's, it's not an act of charity. We've, we've done very well focusing on physicians. And to Vinod, who says that half of physicians are below average, I would say 75% of venture capitalists lose money. So <laughs> you, could, you could take that. Um, yes, this is my second time around on a physician-focused uh, software startup. I guess I'm surprised more people aren't focused on physicians. I mean, let's face it, people. We don't have a hospital administrator shortage. We have a physician shortage. And yet it seems, and I love the extormony uh, presentation <laughs> earlier, but it seems like so much of our investment in healthcare IT is around making administration easier, more efficient, as opposed to making physicians more efficient. So I didn't have much of a choice. I had two physician roommates at Stanford, and I was a Palm Pilot, you know, amateur programmer and database guy. So they more or less held me down and, and made me <laughs> produce Hippocrates. Uh, so the thing that was, I mean, I remember when Hippocrates came out and I used it as a, uh, as a res med student, I think, and as a resident. And what was remarkable about it is that it wasn't fancy, it wasn't, you know, all sorts of graphics flying around the place, but it was just incredibly useful. I mean, it's sort of the way that up to date isn't very elegant, but it's really, really useful. Mm -hmm. So is that sort of the sensibility that you've tried to bring to uh, Doximity? Maybe, I'm not sure if everyone knows what Doximity is, but do you want to explain it? Sure, sure. Um, so Doximity is a, uh, the leading secure professional network for physicians. Um, we provide a place where physicians can find experts. So we had one the other day who had a patient who was bit by a lab monkey, <laughs> and the lab monkey had been infected, and there were maybe five people in the world who would know what to do with this zoonosis and they were able to find three of them on Doximity, searching for that zoonosis, send them a note and, and get advice, which was great. Um, we also find, uh, provide a place for doctors to manage their schedule and contacts. So once someone has their on-call schedule uh, on our product, we see that they use it very frequently. And just their contacts, uh, just keeping track of who your colleagues are and you know, the 200 or 300 different physicians and average uh, primary care physician will deal with in a year. I'll tell you, part of my inspiration, uh, early inspiration for Doximity was while at Hippocrates, we were out talking uh, to doctors, one of whom still had a Palm Pilot, and this was in you know, 2007, 2008, and I said, well, you know, when are you going to upgrade you know, this new thing called the iPhone? <laughs> and we had been on stage with Steve Jobs, and you know, we were really pushing the iPhone, and she said, well, the problem is every new partner who joins our practice, she was an endocrinologist, what we do is we have this great contact list here in the Palm Pilot and we beam it over <laughs> to everyone else. And so they, they needed to keep using the Palm Pilot just to keep track of, in effect, their referral list uh, and phone numbers of other physicians. So today on Doximity, that's been one of the, the surprise hits. Um, we have uh, over 220,000 U.S. physicians, um, 5 million different colleague connections between them, but a third of the time, doctors will actually share their private line or their cell phone number with each other, which is just a huge immediate utility to make it easier to have the cell phone number of that orthopedic surgeon I referred to if I need to get a hold of him or her. I mean, that, one of the things that's sort of so crazy to me about all this is, you know, the killer app for, so this killer app for Doximity is a fax, yes. right? Is you're actually able, because of all the HIPAA laws and stuff, for, for physicians to communicate, they can't just, you know, email or text. You have to fax things to each other. Right. And so by enabling physicians to do that, you're able to, that's, that's, the, that's the sort of, that's one of our that's what you bring to the course, table. David is a physician, for those who don't know. Uh, yes, you know, we began wanting to be a secure texting company, and we failed. What we found out was being a secure texter required, you need to have everyone else you needed to text right away, and it was more urgent. So then we moved to more secure email, and that was going better. We have a lot of secure emails. Uh, but now we do 30,000 secure messages a day, doctor to doctor, 
And for better or worse, about half of those are actually faxes. <laughs> and so we give doctors a way that they can receive a, an e-fax or send an e-fax. They can actually sign it right there on their device. And that's a big time saver. And again, I keep coming back to this, but you know, at Apocrypha, we used to say there were three things you had to do to, to have a successful product. You had to save time, uh, make money, and improve care. Ideally, all three, at least two of the three. And I can't tell you the number of companies that we would meet with, talk to, who wouldn't do more than one of the three. And at the end of the day, doctors are just very time-strapped, busy, busy people. So I think one of the key things we've done is just made it faster to communicate. Uh, and that's a big, big overhead in the system. And so do you, do you feel like you are, um, by doing that, you were, the other day we were talking, you sort of gave, a, I thought it was a pretty compelling use case of where, of all things, the ability to share information rapidly by fax turned out to be uh, influential for someone in the ER was? Or was, was trying sure, to we've had, we get a new case a week that uh, one of our members will email us with. Uh, my favorite lately is we had someone at Oakland Children's Hospital uh, at a, had a six-year-old girl who was coding. I mean, she was, she was dying. She was an epileptic, and he needed to know what medication she was on. And typically that would take several steps of going and calling and trying to find someone and getting it faxed over and sent around. And on his iPad right there, he was able to message over and, and get a message back with the medication list and give her the medication she needed. So that, that's what gets us up in the morning. Yeah. I mean, it's really trying to cobble together this, this uh, Humpty Dumpty system we yeah. have. Um, I'll tell you, uh, I know Fazard Mastashari is here. He said one of the best quotes on this I've heard in a while. It was a few weeks ago. He said, you, we can't make it profitable to hoard patient information. We cannot make it profitable to hoard patient information. And yet this system, which really isn't a system, it's a market. This healthcare market that we're in today, it is profitable to hoard. So we're taking a different tack than the HIEs and some of the EHR inter interoperability initiatives, which I also hope are successful. And we're going really with the power of the individual, the, the individual doctor who wants to do the right thing for that patient, who is at risk of being sued if they don't do the right thing, who today wastes a lot of their day just hunting down what one uh, healthcare receptionist, she called the 404 errors, you know, <laughs> the file not found, which happens all the time. So do you worry at all that to the extent you're sort of building on this sort of a, on sort of this, the fundamental properties of sort of an antiquated and hopefully soon to be obsolete system by allowing people who are dependent on it to do things a little bit more, more efficiently? But d does it threaten to be you sort of, if, if there really is fundamental change, are you going to be sort of disrupted? Are you sort of, you know, sort of like scavenging on sort of the problems of the system today. You know, oh, we can't communicate because we... Well, here's the thing. Even, even if we had one EHR that ran the whole country, there would still be the need for individual messages person to person. And we're certainly far away from one EHR to run the whole country right now. Um, Daniel Pink, I know, was, uh, uh, wrote a book called Free Agent Nation. He talked about industries would be transformed by the Internet. And they have. Uh, journalism, Hollywood, you know, it's really about the individual contractor with their expertise, knowing what they know, contributing to the project, not having to worry about whether or not I work in the New York Times newsroom or not. I can contribute uh, from wherever I am because I have the internet and email and I can do that. I think medicine will get there. It does require authenticating every, every person, every node, and that takes us a few days per doctor to go and authenticate everyone and then encrypting it. But we've done it in finance, we've done it in other places. I do think it will be uh, disruptive, to say the least, um, when you know, physicians are just as easily able to share lab records no matter what other doctor you've seen. So in a sense, uh, you're creating this peripheral, or, you know, <clears throat> this peripheral system that's able to allow doctors, at least, to share information with each other yeah. and sort of make their lives easier. Yeah. But what's interesting is the way, at least my understanding, is that the way you make money now is sort of like LinkedIn for doctors. Right. Is that right? So maybe explain that a little bit. It is. Uh, so, so two things. First, back to communication <laughs> for a moment. You know, Warren Buffett has a good quote, which is that uh, healthcare is the tapeworm on American productivity, <laughs> oh, <my laughs> which God. is... You know, his view, I mean, being an investor in Coca-Cola and GM, he sees the healthcare costs, you know, spiraling. And I would argue that if healthcare really is the tape around American productivity, then medical communication is sort of the compound fracture. <laughs> it's so obvious, it's so out there, you see the fax machine humming, it really is a, okay. a big pain point compared to other systems. So now the how we make money. Um, 
this is a West Coast audience, so I assume no one cares about monetization, but <laughs> uh, we, could, we could at least talk a little bit about it. We're, we're doing pretty well. We, we launched here two years ago at uh, Health 2.0. We've been mainly focused on, again, saving doctors time and growing our user base. We're over 220,000 now, every specialty, every hospital. Earlier this year, we started piloting working with recruiters, mainly hospital system recruiters. There is a physician shortage. Uh, people are trying to recruit physicians, and it's been going really, really well. So uh, I don't want to go into too many details about this. We are going to be announcing some client milestones shortly, but suffice it to say, we're you know, on track to uh, turn a profit at our current expense rate you know, next year. And the best part is, I think physicians have actually enjoyed the service. That's why we, we tested it first. Um, Today, if you're a physician and you're looking for a new job, a career, you would have to go to a, a job board, uh, which hasn't evolved much beyond you know, the back of the journal classified ads. Mm -hmm. It will say something like, um, here's a job within three hours of hunting and fishing and competitive salary. Right. <laughs> and that isn't very helpful to you. Uh, by making uh, the recruiters not have more than 30 messages a month, we require them to put the salary, the call duty, and the location of the position into the actual you know, core text of the email. We've had really good responses from doctors. It's a way for them, even if I'm not interested in a job, I know what an interventional cardiologist would make in Texas now, right. and that's interesting to me. So they view it as, as a value add. And so it's definitely the, uh, the, exactly the Daniel Pink turning everyone into free agents and, 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 right. and empowering them. But does that give you really the headroom to kind of get the exponential growth you really kind of want? I mean, how many people can you get and how much disruption, more disruption can you have in the physician recruiter market? I mean, do you get to become the next LinkedIn by disrupting every last physician recruiter? Well, I'll say this. It, it's plenty of headroom for us to be, a, I think, a profitable, sustaining, ongoing business. And so we can focus on our social mission of giving every doctor a free e-fax, which will hopefully become yeah. for free, secure email as more and more of them join. Right. Um, but it's just the start of what we'll do uh, financially. I think there's plenty of other systems around uh, sharing data and being that, I think, that visa for healthcare, the, the, the company that keeps the network authenticated in control, encrypted, but allows uh, patient data and secure messages to move. In the last 30 seconds, you want to just say you had a pretty interesting announcement today about your API. Do you want to say something about that? Yes. So we do have a login with Doximity API. It's been available for several months um, in beta. We're now launching it. We announced it earlier today. We have over 50 different API partners uh, on it. If you're setting up a new app or a site and you want a quick way to verify that someone is a physician and know where they're state licensed and know what their research is and have a nice full CV on them uh, without having to make them go through this full hideous registration process. But you already did that for them. We've already done that for them. We you know, have nearly a third of US physicians already as active members. You can just put that login with Doximity. It's OAuth2, so very, very straightforward. And, and the cool thing about this, as I understand it, is that it's not really part of your, mon your direct monetization strategies. You're not making money off this specifically, but you're just using it to encourage other people to use the resource to make it more sticky, and then to encourage more users and to sort of then to monetize it that way. Yeah, it's very much like uh, Facebook Connect or, or other uh, OAuth strategies. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm seeing thank Matt you, out there. So yes. wrap it up. Thank you. Great.